All right, hello. Um, my name is Melanie Snyder, and I am the club president of the Culinary Science Club, and it is my privilege to introduce our guest speaker tonight. Our guest speaker has earned a reputation for applying science and technology in the kitchen. He has earned degrees of biochemistry and mathematics and has combined them with his culinary skills to get him to where he is today. He has experience working in several top restaurants, including the Fat Duck Restaurant in Berkshire, England. There he has um, worked in the experimental kitchen, helping to um, develop new creative dishes for their menu. He has written extensively on the science and, of food and cooking for the Fat Duck Cookbook and has published scholarly research in the Journal of Agriculture and, and Food Chemistry and the Journal of Food Science. He is one of the co-authors of The Modernist Cuisine, a beautifully illustrated six-volume set dedicated to the science of cooking. On behalf of the Culinary Science Club, the Food Science and Human Nutrition Department, and the Iowa State Lectures Committee, please join me in welcoming Chef Chris Young. Thank you very much. Ooh. Thank you. Thank you. Wow, a lot of you tonight. Um, I certainly never really expected to be going around giving talks on the science of cooking. Uh, as Melanie said, I started with uh, degrees in biochemistry and mathematics uh, at the University of Washington. Uh, but at some point, I looked up from my studies and said, you know, this really isn't where my passion lays. And I'd always enjoyed cooking, so I figured, well, I'm going to get a job as a cook because, well, at a minimum, I'll become a much better cook than I, than I am at that point and, and also make some money. So I was right about half of that. Um, <clears throat> Needless to say, I ended up knocking on a lot of chefs' doors because there wasn't a lot of interest in hiring a scientist with no formal training as a cook. Um, but I did eventually find a wonderful kitchen to apprentice in and had started working in Seattle. This was in the early 2000s. Uh, and then around 2003, I heard about a funny chef with a funny name in England named Heston Blumenthal who was trying to apply science to his cooking to make food more delicious, to make it more interesting, to make it more fun. Now, it sounded spectacular. So. I racked up even more debt and flew myself over to London and had a meal that was just an epiphany for me. Uh, the meal actually began with a dish called the liquid nitrogen poached green pea sour. Now, the best way to describe this dish is the waiter wheels a gyrodon up to your table, which is just fantastic, very old school. And uh, they have this cauldron of boiling liquid nitrogen, boiling at 200 degrees Celsius below zero, about minus 320 Fahrenheit, if I've got my math right. Um, they take a canister of whipping cream siphon, squirt a dollop of what looks like shaving mousse out into a spoon, spoon, knock it into that liquid nitrogen, turning it over, poaching it for exactly eight seconds, handing it to you, draining it with the, uh, from the liquid nitrogen, and asking you to eat it in one bite. And you bite into it, and oh my god, is it delicious. You get this puff of condensation, this dragon smoke out your nose. You get this shattering shell in your mouth. You get this rush of coolness, and then the, the soft, luscious, very acidic, bright lime juice flavor of the mousse in the center. And it's a great way to kick off the meal because it says this is going to be completely different than anything you've ever had before. And the rest of the meal was. Every dish after that was just this fantastic uh, culinary experience that really showed you what food could be. At the, end of the menu, at, the, at the end of my meal that night, I knew I absolutely had to have a job here. And I said I would be happy to come back and work for free for as long as you will have me. Uh, Turned out to be a very lucky thing for me. Working for Heston was an inspiration. I worked with an incredibly talented culinary team for over five years, uh, many of whom helped us create new dishes for the restaurant. But really what I took away from that experience was what a talented chef could accomplish when enabled by an appreciation and understanding of the science that goes on in everybody's kitchen. And the problem is, I asked myself, where do you turn to basically learn these techniques? Where, do you, where are you taught about this? I mean, for me, I was able to bring my formal training as a science to bear. I was able to read books. I was able to find people and ask questions. But for a young chef, where do you learn to go beyond recipes? Where do you learn to go beyond techniques and to develop new things, create dishes that nobody's ever eaten before? So around 2007, I had met a like-minded individual in, uh, in the form of my co-author, Nathan Mirvold who is also an outstanding scientist, um, was actually a technologist, uh, was the former chief technology officer of Microsoft. But the reason we had become friends is we shared a passion for the science of cooking. In fact, specifically, we shared a passion for barbecue. We both complete nuts about American-style barbecue. And so we used to 
constantly be exchanging emails of how could we do this better? How could we make better brisket? And around 2007, I was getting ready to leave. The fat duck moved back to the States. And I sent him an email simply saying, Nathan, I'm going to be leaving the fat duck if you'd like to stay in touch. Use this other email address to, to keep in touch going forward. Three minutes later, I get an email back from him. The subject line simply said, crazy idea. The email said, why don't you come work for me? So Nathan uh, had made quite a bit of money at Microsoft. And he said, well, why don't you come to my boat for the weekend in the Mediterranean? And I'll tell you about this little idea I have. So not really a hard option. So I spent the weekend on, on, on the boat with him. And we just sort of sat down and started outlining the book that we wanted to exist, the book that we really wished we had had 10 years ago when we started getting into this cooking. And that's really how this began. We basically didn't think anybody else would uh, create this book. So I'll get a couple, of this, a little of this out of the way quickly. Obviously, the book is called Modernist Cuisine, The Art and Science of Cooking. Uh, Nathan and myself wrote it along with my co-author, Maxine Billet, who came with me from The Fat Duck. A couple stats you may have heard. It's indeed five volumes plus 350-page <clears throat> waterproof kitchen manual. The pages are actually washable. This is where we put a lot of the recipes and reference tables that occur in this book on something that you could actually take into the kitchen. It's pretty big. It's a lot bigger than we ever expected. <laughs> Over 2,400 pages. But it's, part of the reason it's so large is it's lavishly illustrated with photographs because we really wanted to bring the subject alive. We wanted to share our excitement. And one of the ways to do that was in a very visual way. In fact, although this is a lot of photographs, we shot over 170,000 photographs over three years for this book. It has over 1,500 recipes that were created by our team or adapted from other chefs that have inspired us uh, in our journeys around the world. And it's pretty big in every other way. Over a million words of text. If you put each of those words end to end, it's over six miles. I, I spent most of the better part of last fall walking those six miles over and over during the proofreading stage. But my favorite statistic of all is this one. It's 44 pounds. And of that 44 pounds, four of it's ink. We had a mock-up made of this before it was printed by the printer. And we picked it up and went, wow, that's really heavy. And they said, oh, it's going to get heavier. And we went, why? They said, the ink. He said, really? They said, oh, yeah, there will be about four pounds of ink. So sure enough, pretty large. It's a hard book to describe, but ultimately, it's an encyclopedic treatment of cooking. It covers, in fact, it started as a book about sous vide cooking. Now, I don't know how, I'm not going to assume everyone's familiar with this method of cooking, but this is done in most high end restaurants now. Um, let's see, apparently I pulled the wrong presentation up. That should have paused. I'll come back to sous vide cooking. We cover traditional cooking as well, everything from pot roasting to stir frying. We also cover things like modern ovens. These are controlled vapor ovens, pretty common in commercial kitchens, not so much at home. We cover microwaves, too. We also wanted to take a look at technology that's maybe more common in the laboratory, but has pro profound implications on creativity in the kitchen. And we wanted to explain it in a very practical way for chefs so that you can see how this can be used to really do new things. So one example that you see here, essentially, this is a rotor stator homogenizer. This is a blender on steroids. And one of the cool things you can do with it is you can create emulsions. Now, mayonnaise is emulsions, butters are emulsion. One of the ideas we had is we said, well, ice cream essentially is you know, made from an emulsion of cream. And that's just an, you know, butter fat dispersed in water. And there's some proteins and there's some sugars in it. And we said, well, what do we need the cream for? So we had the idea of taking flavor for oils, like pistachio oil, and using this machine to emulsify it into water with suitable sugars and proteins to essentially came from, create a cream that's never seen in utter. But when you freeze it, it's got this fantastic flavor of pistachio. Pistachio is one of these really delicate flavors that can be very easily overwhelmed by the milk flavor. And so other people have problems with milk altogether. We're able to create an ice cream just from pistachio and nothing but pistachio plus a little bit of sugar. You can extend this idea to all sorts of things. We do a veal cream sauce for a Blanquette de Veau that's, in fact, kosher because the cream sauce never saw a cow. Um, so we think that's pretty cool. Um, we also look at a lot of the ingredients that can be intimidating or maybe even unfamiliar. But we wanted to really go back and say, look, a lot of these are no stranger than seaweed. Um, some of them have been used in Asia for thousands of years. But you can do really tremendous things 
in the kitchen in the hands of a talented chef with these ingredients. But we also wanted to look at familiar ingredients that we all know. We wanted to look at them in ways that have never before really been considered. So eggs are a fantastic ingredient. I think I was told somebody from the, uh, from the egg uh, council will be here tonight. We love eggs. We have hundreds of recipes for eggs in this book because they're just incredibly versatile and there's things you never thought to do with them. Um, sometimes we just wanted to show the sheer beauty of food. This is a blueberry. Those orange things, which are a little hard to see, those are the seeds. You've never really seen them that way before. It, they just look so cool up close. And this is one of the techniques we used a lot in the book. It's uh, Normally when you take a photograph of something this detailed, a little bit's in focus and everything else is out of focus. So one of the techniques we, we use is we actually take hundreds of photos, changing the focal plane a little bit each time, and then we use software to recombine all the information so that everything's perfectly in focus. It allows you to see into food in ways that you've never seen it before, and I think sometimes that can just be inspiring. This is a microscopic photo of potatoes. The uh, blue bits are the cell walls. The pink globules are basically your gooey water balloon-like structures of starch granules. Now the secret to mashed potato, it turns out, is getting those blue parts broken apart without rupturing the gooey water balloons. So we take a look at basically the science of how do you cook the perfect mashed potato to keep it silky and smooth or light and fluffy but without making it sort of gluey and stringy. And it all comes down to basically managing those starch granules. This is another really cool photo I love. This is actually one millimeter of steak. Now what a lot of people assume is this white part, that's how, they think that's fat. Not, not fat at all. That's actually the meat. It turns, in fact, if you were standing quite far away from it, it would look like gray overcooked meat. But up close, it's whiter than white. If you take an egg white and you start with it raw, it's translucent. But when you cook it, it goes opaque and white because it, it coagulates the proteins and that proteins now scatter light. Meat does the same thing because when you cook meat, you're causing it to gel. You may not think of meat as a gel, but in fact, that's what it is. So you have the crust, you have the flavor creation zone, then you have the point where the proteins are coagulating and the meat's starting to overcook. The chasms that are being created is actually the water that's flashing to steam, pushing itself apart as that water expands into steam, and it's actually ripping apart the surface of the steak by boiling it essentially from the inside out. So this is gonna go pretty quickly, but we, we really wanted to show how to apply this understanding in a practical way with lots of step-by-step -step photos. If you want to learn traditional French cooking, if you want to learn Japanese techniques, there are tons of books this thick that will show you how to truss a, uh, a chicken or bone out a duck like a Frenchman. But there's really no book that shows how to do some of the techniques that leading restaurants around the world have been doing the last 10 years. And that was really one of our early inspirations is we sort of felt one of our contributions to the culinary community would be to aggregate these techniques that you could spend a lifetime searching out otherwise, put them in one place and document them in a very clear fashion to see how to do it. So I'll just flip through some of our pages for a moment. So make your head spin a little bit. Um, there's literally hundreds of them. But we wanted to explain why the techniques work. We really wanted to look at the physics, the chemistry of what was going on, but we wanted to do it in a way that was practical and useful for chefs or people who are just enthusiastic about cooking. So a few more pages just to give you a sense of how we try to tell the science story in a very visually compelling way. And I'll come back to some of these and talk about them a little later. So one of the things that we, yeah, no, don't go running for the exit. I'm really not going to stand up here and try to explain Fourier's heat equation and the nitty gritty of partial differential equations. But I am going to explain why we spend a whole chapter talking about heat. Because heat is the ingredient that we all use as cooks. And this equation 
while the specifics may not be important to chefs, the implications are tremendously important because it explains how long will something take to cook? How evenly is it gonna cook? Why is one technique of cooking different than another? Very often it comes down to subtle differences in the heat transfer and the knock-on effects that that has. So to take a specific example that I think most people can appreciate is grilling. This is one of our cutaway photographs and one of the ways we try to bring people into the process of what's going on when you cook food is to literally cut things in half so that you can see inside it because there's an awful lot going on with something that's as seemingly simple as grilling. Each of these points sort of drawing your attention to the various things going on. Just to choose one, I'll talk about where that grilled flavor comes from that sets grilling apart from say pan roasting. It turns out it's the dripping that create the flavor of grilled food. So what you've got here is a nice hot coal and these are drippings from a hamburger. And the oil basically it starts to evaporate, boil off, it's reaching its smoking point and then the vapors ignite. You're basically forging aroma compounds in, the, in those flames. A lot of those aroma compounds are carried up by the rising air currents and redeposited on the food and that adds the characteristic flavor that makes grilled food, food so delicious. But of course, the yellow part of the flame, that's soot. That soot glowing incandescently hot like a filament in a light bulb. And if you get your food too near to that, you have soot on your food and it's pretty acrid and unpleasant. So the trick is getting the food at just the right height so that you don't get it soot covered, but you do get those grilled flavors on it. So the question is, what's the right height? Well, grilling's actually really kind of counterintuitive because it's using radiant heat. It's the radiant heat of, of the glowing coals. Most things, the further you get away from them, the cooler it's gonna get. Grilling, not so. It's like a light bulb. If I'm this close to a light bulb and then I step back, the light bulb is about the same brightness. Grills work the same way. The food is looking at the light coming from the coals. Up close, it's seeing a lot of light and it's very hot. You raise it above those flames, the, temp the heat it's basically experiencing, it hasn't changed. You have to get really far away before the intensity of that grilled heat starts to fall. So the idea of raising or lowering your grill to control the temperature it's cooking at doesn't really work until you get several multiples of the grill's diameter away from the coals and that's when you start getting into rotisserie or Argentina asado. So this basically shows how the intensity of the radiant heat falls off with distance. And some people say, who cares? I say, why not? Water is uh, another thing that we felt was really important to talk about and sort of share our particular views. I mean, at the end of the day, you can think of food as water with a bunch of impurities. <laughs> Carrots have as much water in them as milk does. It's one of the miracles of nature that it doesn't seem that it's that wet. It's so structured, but in fact, it's a very wet thing. Lettuce, my friend calls lettuce a crunchy water bottle. It's probably the most expensive way to ship water around the planet. But understanding water is the difference between great sautés and mediocre ones because the secret of a great sauté is getting the water to flash to steam fast enough so that it doesn't accumulate in the pan and end up stewing your vegetables because you get very different flavor reactions depending on those situations. So if your burner's underpowered, you're gonna get stewed vegetables, not great sautéed. I, I have a friend uh, actually from Ames, Iowa. He's making fun of me today for, for uh, being here, but he has an unnatural fetish for dry fried green beans. And he, was, he's, he bought a new house recently and said, Chris, I, I have this very fancy German stove and I love to make dry fried green beans, but how come I can't make them as well as they do at that Chinese restaurant down the street? And I said, well, that German stove sure is fancy, but a typical wok burner looks something like this. It's about 250,000 BTU hours of, of heat coming out of there. It sounds like a jet engine on an afterburner. Your home stove, your fancy one, it has maybe one-tenth that amount of power if you're lucky. A uh, more common home burner has maybe one-twentieth. You can't put enough heat into the pan fast enough to flash that water to steam, and so you end up stewing the vegetables rather than getting a blistered, sautéed texture and flavor. So the much better solution is to use a different technique. Deep frying vegetables can be fantastic, even as good as dry fried, and that's doable at home. Getting water into steam also, uh, doing it fast enough is why things like this work. I just love that, it's cool. It's really pretty fascinating what's going, oh. uh, let's go back. See, 
technology. There we go. It's pretty interesting what you have going on here. You have a tiny little bit of water left in that corn kernel. And the oil is bringing so much heat into the surface that that water just beneath the seed coat starts flashing into steam. Now, water's pretty interesting stuff. When you turn it into steam, it expands in volume by almost a factor of 1,700. So that steam is trying to escape. The first place it does is a little weak spot at the bottom of the corn kernel. So it turns into a steam rocket, you get lift off. But as heat keeps diffusing in from the surface towards the core, more and more water is being flashed to steam. And at some point, that seed coat doesn't have the strength to hold it. So poof, it starts to expand out. It's actually creating a foam in the same way baking bread rises in your oven from water being converted into steam. But this is just happening much faster. Now, the reason popcorn ends up crunchy is as that foam expands, an expanding gas cools. And so that expanding gas cools and causes the foam to become rigid and hard as it cools. And that's why popcorn works. Now, go, oh, okay, yeah, popcorn, not, not that interesting. But it turns out understanding those principles can have some profound implications on how to make crisper skin, for example, on your pork chop. And I'll come back to that. This, by the way, is the camera we use to shoot those movies. It's called a Phantom V12. There's about five of these in the country, and it will shoot high definition video at about 6,800 frames a second. So for gratuitous fun, and because I can't put it in the book, I'll show some movies. Um, this is classic bartender technique of basically uh, incinerating the peel oils. Again, forging those characteristic burnt, burnt orange aromas. Now, when you have a camera like this, at some point, somebody's going to go, hey, why don't we get a gun? <laughs> so I think we're the only cookbook with a recipe for ballistics gelatin in it. <laughs> it's great the way it just keeps going. It makes me really not want to get shot. <laughs> So seeing into the cooking process, understanding what's going on with heat, what's going on with water, what's going on with the meat and the flavor creations, personally, I think it can be interesting for its own sake. It gives you a view into the way the world works. The kitchen is the laboratory we all have. It's a place for fun and creativity. And I think that's what's interesting about this. But I think also exploring the hows and whys of cooking can become an inspiration. This cutaway of a traditional pork pot roast inspired this dish by our team. Now, probably looks like a pork chop cooked by a caveman. But the surprise is absolutely everything in that photo is edible. And I'm biased, but I think it's delicious, too. The ash actually tastes like gingerbread spice. The, uh, somebody was asking me about charred leeks tonight. Those leeks, if you push on them, you have a molten charred center that's just fantastic. The coals, a little bit of kitchen chemistry here. We take a prune, we braise it in cognac. Then we take the braising juices from the pork roast. We add a non-sweet sugar, isomalt, and we boil it into a syrup. And then we just do simple little acid-base chemistry. We mix some baking powder, or baking soda, and vinegar in. We get a nice violent foaming reaction. We quickly coat the confit prunes in that boiling syrup. And then we put it into a vacuum chamber. Raise it up to about 90,000 feet high. And those bubbles keep expanding as you reduce the pressure on them. And as they do, they cool that foam down. It hardens into an edible pumice that tastes like braised. Basically, in the center, you have a chewy, molten uh, prune, and they have this crisp, shattering, delicious pork flavor around it. I think it's pretty fun. But even if that's not your cup of tea, the same ideas can be used for making a better pork chop. Um, I have kind of a love for pork chops and uh, really love for crispy skin, so we went way overboard on the book on skin. But essentially, this is a technique we developed where we take our best end of pork loin, we take the sk uh, skin off, and we, we pressure cook it to render basically uh, gelatinize the, the collagen in the skin. And then we dry it. Now this far, pretty much how you make pork rinds. We then grind it and sift it into the right granule size so that it's going to stick to the pork loin the best. And eventually we're going to deep fry that pork chop so that that skin puffs up and you get this incredibly crisp, crackling crust on this really luscious piece of meat. But part of the trick we use to prevent the meat from overcooking is we cook the meat separately at the temperature we like, which is about 140 Fahrenheit for pork chop. Then we, just before coating it with the dried skin and knowing that we're going to deep fry it, we plunge it into liquid nitrogen for about 20 seconds first. The idea is liquid nitrogen is about 200 degrees below zero. Your deep frying oil is about 200 degrees above zero. 
we freeze the same amount of flesh that we would otherwise overcook when we deep fry it. So I think liquid nitrogen is a great thing to have around your house. But even if you don't, you can usually get dry ice. And you can do the same thing with a chicken breast with dry ice. It's actually quite easy. Just before I sear it, I'll put it down on a block of dry ice for a couple minutes to freeze a thin layer of flesh underneath it. That frozen layer acts as an insulator and prevents the flesh from overcooking. So we have lots of recipes throughout the book where we try to put this into an actual working way. Um, obviously, we made them all because we think they're delicious. But throughout these recipes, we actually tried to put in a lot of tips and margin notes and techniques on how you could adapt this, even if you're not going to do this elaborate 30-hour recipe that takes a team of six people to do. You know, Maybe you can just take this one part of the recipe and make a better roast chicken. Or maybe you can read this margin note and it tells you where to find the best cut of a ribeye. So we tried to put a lot of rewards in for people to actually take the time to read the recipes, even if you don't make them. So I'm going to talk about one of, my one of the recipes that changed my life. In fact, we call this the omelet that will change your life. Um, yeah, one of the hardships of making the book is we had to sit around eating these things for years. It was, it was awful. Um, and as I said, we wanted to do a lot of things with eggs. So we created an omelet that has this unbelievably soft texture. You can see how we roll it up like a crepe. And we basically make a scrambled egg filling that goes into it that we do out of a whipping cream siphon. The overall experience is just delicious. Now we said, hey, let's go a step too far and make it a striped omelet. So we got this basically pastry comb, and we make a black truffle puree with egg yolk in it. We comb it out, then we cook it, and that sets the stripes. And then you come back and you pour the, uh, the omelet mixture over it, cook it again, and you create these big sheets that you can make in advance that have this fantastic texture. OK, so maybe you don't want to do that. But here's the one tip I will tell you that I think will change your life. The secret to a great three egg omelet is throw away one of the whites. It turns out just that one act of getting rid of one of the whites makes the omelet so much more tender, so much more rich and delicious, that you kind of wonder why nobody thought to do it before. And this kind of goes into something that we really wanted to explain throughout the book is, sure, we can have these recipes. We can have step-by-step -step techniques. But how do you go beyond that? How do you do things that really haven't been done before? So we tried to create a lot of tables like this. Now, I know you can't read this, but this is our, our basically our omelet table. We literally made hundreds and hundreds, I think about 540 variations on egg yolk, whole eggs, how much they were blended with water, and what the cooking temperature was. And then we sat there eating them to try to figure out what's that texture like. Because it turns out, at, the, at different temperatures, I can get the same texture with different blends of egg yolks and egg white. So if I want it richer, but I want it softer, I need to lower the temperature, because otherwise my gelled eggs are going to be too strong. So you literally can come over to the table and go, oh, I want a lot of egg yolks, so I need to lower my cook cooking temperature down to 70 Celsius to get that texture that I really want. Conversely, you might want something that's a firmer frittata-like texture. Well, that's in the table, too. So we tried to create a lot of these tables that condense literally hundreds of recipes into fairly simple, straightforward tables that tell you how to make just about any texture you want. A little more avant-garde, perhaps, is hot fruit, and ve hot fruit or vegetable gels. You might never have thought you wanted to make a hot green apple gel, but if you do, we tell you how to do it. But more importantly, it's choose your texture. Do you want it firm and brittle? Do you want it soft and elastic, somewhere in between? There's the different gelling agents that will tell you how to achieve that texture. But it turns out the right proportions depend on the pH of the fruit or vegetable. So over here is a table of typical pHs for about 80 fruits and vegetables. So it's sort of, again, choose your own ending. But then we have step by steps showing how to use these tables, putting them into action. A hot green apple gel is made a little bit different than a hot banana gel or a hot orange gel. So these are all slight variations, but it give you a sense of how you can use these tables to do things that haven't been done before. Very often, they're really meant to be starting points for your own creativity. Um, as I said, the book originally started out as a book about sous vide. We thought, oh, maybe it'll be 300 pages. And we thought we'd really explain how to do sous vide both safely and how to do it well, because there wasn't a lot of good information out there on this technique. Now, for those of you who aren't familiar with sous vide cooking, this is essentially where you're cooking the food to the exact temperature you want to eat it at. So if I want my chicken 
done. I cook it to 140. There's no reason to put it in an oven at 350 degrees. It'll give me crispy skin. But by the time it, the core temperature reaches 140, a whole lot of that chicken is overcooked. It's sort of a compromise. You're using high heat to get crisp skin. You end up overcooking a bunch of the flesh, and your core temperature is kind of the texture you want. We say, why not cook the whole chicken at 140? And then if you want crispy skin, really quickly deep fry it, or use a blowtorch, or quickly sear it on a grill afterwards. In other words, split the cooking process into two stages. Cook it at the temperature you want it at, then sear it or blanch it afterwards to get the surface texture you want. Don't compromise with this hotter than uh, necessary cooking. The problem is this becomes kind of unintuitive. Most people aren't used to thinking about, oh, what temperature do I want my short rib cooked to? Well, it kind of depends. Do you want your short rib to have a steak-like firm New York strip texture? Well, 54 degrees for 48 hours gives you that in spades. Maybe you don't have that much time. Well. If you're willing to have a flakier texture, you can use 80 Celsius for about eight hours, and that'll give you a flaky texture. But those aren't the only choices, of course. So we created tables with best bet times and temperatures for different textures for different cuts of meat. Again, this was like an incredibly labor-intensive thing to do. We had to go through cooking dozens and dozens of cuts to try to sort of find out what combination of time and temperature we're going to give the texture we wanted. But hopefully these tables are starting points for some of the chefs in our audience, for example, of I want this pork chop medium rare. What temperature is the best one to use? Or I want a flaky texture for my carnitas. How to do that? Or you know what? I don't have 48 hours. How can I use a pressure cooker to get the same result in 20 minutes? All of that's encapsulated in these best bet tables. So that's how we started out. It'll be about sous vide. Maybe we'll add a few other recipes in. And then we kind of got carried away. Um, as I said, Nathan and I are kind of barbecue nuts. So we said, well, you know, we're going to sell a lot of these books in Europe. And I, we both kind of got tired of hearing from some of our European chef friends how, oh, Italy and France, they have these great traditions of these micro-regional cuisines where the cuisine of one town is different than another. You don't have anything like that in America. Wrong. <laughs> we have barbecue. Barbecue in Lexington is completely different than the barbecue you're going to find in the coastal lands of North Carolina. And plenty of people from Texas would tell you that's not even barbecue. The barbecue you find in Alabama is different than South Carolina. So we really wanted to create this map to show the various micro-regional aspects of American barbecue. And then we kind of kept going. We ended up creating 12 different examples of regional sauces with sort of a no-holds-barred approach to making the best version we could. And then we created about 30 barbecue recipes and a couple pastramis. And then, oh, well, we should do a cornbread recipe. We should do coleslaw recipes. So we got completely carried away, and we ended up with an entire chapter on barbecue. So far, so good. And then one of our cooks, Angina, who's from India, she comes to, a, she comes to me one day and goes, um, you know, curries are kind of like barbecue. And I'm like, no, Angina, no, no, we've got to get the book done. We cannot do this. Too much time. We don't need to do it. So y you can see what a good manager I am. At. <laughs> but this actually goes to the point. A lot of people think this type of cooking is this weird revolution that just started. But I would argue all cooking is just a series of revolutions, and we're just having one revolution right now. India is nothing but a stream of revolutions. What was going curry like before the Portuguese showed up with chili? What about mogul curry before the moguls, or let alone the British, before the British brought dairy into the, the curries? What was an Indian curry like before there were tomatoes? Come to think of it, what was Italian cuisine like before there were tomatoes? And so this is really the point that cuisine is something that humans are constantly reinventing. We're always looking for new ingredients. We're always looking for new flavors and new ways to do things. To me, I think new ingredients are wonderful, but I also think bringing science and technology to the kitchen can also be an inspiration to do new things and create new flavors that delight our senses. And that's what's very exciting about this kind of cuisine to me. Needless to say, creating this book was a tremendous amount of work. So it wouldn't have been possible without my co-author, Nathan. Uh, Nathan obviously financed this, but he was also crazy enough to say, hey, a book like this really should exist, and who else would do this? Now, not a lot of people know Nathan is a chef, and very few people know he's a passionate foodie. He's usually better known for the other things he's done in life. Uh, you might be familiar with one of his other products. <laughs> of course, he and I couldn't do this without a fantastic team. This is our, our head chef, Max, who came with uh, me from the Fat Duck. 
Max made a lot of messes to get these beautiful photos you've seen. In fact, right here, that's how we got this photo. Um, it turns out there's a reason they don't sell half a walk. <laughs> it involves a lot of fire and a lot of things burning up. <laughs> now, the person who generally would egg us on and say, hey, why don't we cut a walk in half, was this gentleman, Ryan Smith. Ryan uh, originally was hired to be our photo editor. And when we started shooting 170,000 photos, um, Ryan was the person who took almost every photo you see in this book. And uh, uh, hopefully, if you like it, the credit goes here. But of course, there was a big uh, team behind even us. Um, actually, before I'll mention a few other team members, people ask, how do we get those cutaways? Well, we have a kitchen, but we also have a machine shop at our invention company. And we really did cut the stuff in half. Everyone assumes it's all Photoshop trickery, but no. This is a wire EDM where we're using electric current, basically a stupid amount of electric current, to arc and erode through the metal, getting a high precision cut of half a Dutch oven. Uh, Ted Ellis here, whose photos you, uh, hands you just saw, uh, formerly was a uh, instrument maker for the CERN nuclear particle detector. He's now the world's foremost expert in cutting kitchenware in half. <laughs> but I think this did serve a purpose of hoping, hopefully really getting chefs into the cooking process of what's actually going on and getting them excited and, and reading and thinking about things they might not otherwise have given a second look. The recipes, everything else was due to our very large culinary team. I have, we have six full-time chefs who for the last five years have done nothing but basically cook for us and develop recipes. It's been hardship, I know, but a, a lot of fun. There is also a large team behind actually producing the book. We had at the high watermark over 36 people working full time on this book, including editors, art directors, copy editors, um, research assistants, and on and on and on. It, it, it turns out there's a reason a book like this hasn't been created before. It is a tremendous amount of work. So hopefully people have some questions. So this is kind of a thank you for, for listening to me. Hopefully you find this interesting. Um, before I go, one last thing just for a little bit of fun. Fastest way to scramble omelet, an egg. <laughs> Thank you. Questions will be here at the center aisle. Anybody has a question? I'll sure make it the Inquisition. <laughs> Fascinating. Um, I've done a little food, food photography as well as many people in this room, and wow, that's nothing like what we've done. <laughs> um, so the obvious question, is: so now that you've done this and you had this whole team assembled, what happens to the team? What happens to the chefs? What happens? What are they going to go do now? You know, we don't entirely know. I, I, I wish we had a better answer than that. Right now, everyone's been really busy doing dinners around the country promoting the book. Um, but you're absolutely right. We've put together a great team, and it would be a shame to lose them. So Nathan and the rest of us are starting to discuss what's next. Um, it's conceivable there might be a few more volumes. It's hard to believe we left anything out. But the book doesn't cover pastry, baking, confectionery. There's a whole bunch of other stuff that ended up on the cutting room floor. So, so there is more to do. Oh, I worked for a chef named William Balikas at a restaurant called Mistral. William was a protege of David Boulay, and it was a fantastic small kitchen, a great place to work. Yeah. Hi, uh, I'm a graduate from the CIA and uh, thinking about starting a, going to school here for food yeah. science. Just wondering if you have any uh, recommendations starting out. That's, um, I'm not sure I'm the best person to be giving career advice. It's a little uh, bit of serendipity that led my path, but I, I certainly think there's a lot to be gained by understanding what's going on in, uh, on in food, and I think the science can be fascinating. What I would say is look broadly, take a lot of different classes and different subjects, and gravitate towards whatever is going to interest you. For me, I love meat. That might not be your thing, but uh, search around.
Um, I'm curious about the kinds of food that you worked with. It seems that another important strain of American cooking is a kind of shopping to find the perfect egg or mm -hmm. the perfect piece of pork. Did, did, you, did you do anything oh, like well. that? Seek out particular kinds of eggs or pigs that had been fed particular diets? Absolutely. In fact, we kind of went overboard in a lot of ways. Um, but maybe not the way most people think. I'm certainly not going to defend, defend bad ingredients. I'm a huge fan of the best quality ingredients you can get, and so much the better if it's local, sustainable, and, uh, and many of the other issues. My personal view is really understanding what it takes to produce a great ingredient is paramount so that you can work with the producers to help everyone up their game. So for example, in the meat section, there was a, you know, there's a big section on the importance of slaughter. What happens at the farm? These are things that are so often done wrong. And as chefs, if slaughter is screwed up, if the animal's treated inhumanely, there's nothing we can do as chefs to salvage that ingredient. It's going to be inferior and mediocre. So the problem is, as a chef, we want the best ingredient, but what do we ask our supplier to do? What do we demand uh, for them to do to raise the quality of ingredients for all of us? And so I believe telling people what things matter, what things they should be working with their suppliers to try to achieve. I think that's important. It's something we spend a lot of time on in the book, both in terms of plant foods, um, but also in terms of animals and seafoods. One of my favorite things I've seen come out of molecular gastronomy is reverse spherification. Yeah. Where did that come from? Um, the food business in 1948, I believe. I did not um, have been around that long. No, uh, it, 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 yeah, it, it turns out that, um, I believe the original patent was filed in England, I think it was 1948, it might have been 1951, um, believe it or not, I don't have everything memorized. Uh, it was basically a way of making, among other things, it was the way of making artificial pimentos to put into olives, it was a way of making pie cherries that wouldn't uh, leak juice all over, or blueberries for muffins, so it was used in a lot of different ways. It's a common property of many gelling agents that they're very sensitive to salt ions and you can get them to do these tricks. People like Ferron rediscovered this um, with the help of food scientists in the late 90s and basically used it to really delicious effect to create these wonderful surprising mm -hmm. treats. So does it solidify all the way through or is it still... It depends on how you do it. If you do reverse spherification, it will not solidify all the way through. Um, direct spherification will eventually, although there's some ways to halt it. But that's all covered in the book. Oh, so this is, um, basically it turns out you can take certain gels, and to get them, they'll basically be gooey liquids, and, before, and they won't gel until you introduce a salt ion, usually calcium or it could be magnesium, but most often calcium. And so what food manufacturers realize is, hey, if we want cherries that are all the same size, we want cherries that don't leak juices when we bake pies, so why don't we take cherry juice? add this seaweed-derived gelling agent, and then we'll just add drops of it into this salt water bath, and they'll solidify it into spheres. And that worked great, but then you could argue, well, the cherry juice wasn't very delicious, and there was shelf life issues, and so it was, you know, it was an inferior low-grade product, but it served, so, solved certain technical problems. That same technology, that same understanding, put in the hand of a talented chef like Ferran Adria in Spain, he created these liquid olives that look just like an olive you pop in your mouth and it would just be a burst of intense olive juice and it was fantastic and we do fun theatrics like that that were surprising and whimsical and so it's a point that the technology isn't inherently evil it's not necessarily an inferior food product it's just the constraints that Ferran is working with are not the same as a food manufacturer. Um, <clears throat> just two quick questions chef. Sure. Do we need bigger kitchens now with all the new equipment that's coming in, and is that what the next few books are going to be about? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, I, I'll point out that the, the kitchen at the Fat Duck was, we jokingly referred to it as ballet in a broom closet. It had about six and a half foot ceilings. It was mi minuscule. We cover every kind of gadget and technology you could want in this book. I don't know of any kitchen on the planet that has all of these toys, nor do I think every kitchen on the planet should. On the other hand, I'd make the argument as a chef. I think most chefs are inherently curious people. And so I think even if you don't have a spray dryer and you're not going to go buy a freeze dryer, I think it's kind of interesting to know how it's made and, and you can make the decisions of what things are appropriate for your kitchen or appropriate for your style of cooking and what things you go, hey, that's interesting but it's not for me. So yeah. we cover everything, but I don't think you need a bigger kitchen. And I, I just want to revisit about that chicken breast. Mm. Um, we've got to serve it at 140. 
so I'm told in this country. You can, legally. Yeah, yeah. Um, how do I get that then by quickly deep frying that and crisping it up if it's, have I already, is it cold? And I've sous vide it earlier and it's cold? Or no, so do the I way keep it out? For, for, out so for the, the chicken breast. So what we would do is we would cook it to 140 Fahrenheit. Uh, the USDA, or the, basically the food laws require that you hold it there for 12.1 minutes to achieve pasteurization. Otherwise, you've got to put that little note on your menu about raw, undercooked foods might kill you. Um, anyway, so you cook it to that temperature sous vide. Then I would take it out, and to crisp the skin, I would essentially put it on dry ice for about three minutes. Seems a little crazy, because you're freezing it, but you're only freezing the skin and the bit beneath it. And then I'd go straight down on a plancha or a griddle. Yeah. That will thaw the skin very quickly and fry it and crisp it up, and it will eventually melt that ice layer. But until it melts that ice layer, the heat of the plancha isn't going to go any further into the chicken breast, so it can't overcook it. So, ho so holding the chicken breast at that temperature, that won't deteriorate. You'd hold it flavor. at that temperature. So if you had a, the way we would do it is I use a CVAP oven, and I hold it at 140 okay. Fahrenheit for service. Yeah. Or I have them in a sous vide bag, and I pull them to or when the order comes on. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Anything else? Thank you. Thanks for coming. I'd like to remind you that there's a book signing and a reception afterwards. So will everyone join me in thanking our speaker one more time? <laughs>